Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com, a proud affiliate of the Hockey News. I'm your host, Nick Berlansky, back from the mountains, joined as always by Nick Horwat, and we are back and ready for what is going to be not only a hectic week and a half leading up to the NHL's trade deadline on March 8th, which is next Friday, but a hectic month of March for the Penguins as they play pretty much every other day. We have weekend back-to-backs on the first three weekends of March, so it's going to be a hectic few weeks here, Horwat. How have you been? Because I haven't talked to you since Thursday. I know, obviously, the Penguins had games on Thursday and Sunday, both victorious, which is good for the Pens moving forward, but you know, with the Bemstrom trade, a lot going on as far as rumors surrounding the Penguins and their current lineup. Uh, you know, it's probably been a little hectic for you as I've been getting sore and bruised on the slopes up in the mountains. Oh, you're good. It's uh, enjoy your time off when you can enjoy yourself. Yeah. And uh, trust me, it's only going to get you came back just in time. You came oh, back yeah. just in time. It's going to not only do we have West Coast games to worry about, we have this trade deadline to worry about. We have new names popping up every day, it feels like, of uh, of who may be on the block and mm-hmm. The list is, <clears throat> excuse me, growing with quality names, not just names, but like quality names that teams might have some real interest in. And um, I, the Penguins' season isn't quite turned in yet. They're keeping themselves alive, and it's. Uh, I tell you what, it's going to be an interesting couple of games. Going to be an interesting road trip, and I think it's going to really decide quite a bit uh, of what this future looks like. Uh, other than that, my weekend's been fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot to obviously unpack with the Penguins yeah. heading into this week. And like you mentioned it, going on to a four-game Western Canada, or not really all in Canada, they also have that game in Seattle. It's it's kind of hard because it's always been labeled the, the Western Canada road trip. Yeah. Now you got to throw Seattle in there. But nonetheless, a lot of 10 p.m. starts, including Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Fortunately, they give us a little bit of a break on Sunday with a 9 p.m. start concerning the Penguins and the Edmonton Oilers. But we do also have a mailbag. Put it out there yesterday. Thank you to everybody that submitted questions. It'll be a two-parter in the second and third segment. We'll get to as many questions as we possibly can in the time span of this episode. But let's start with that Western Canada road trip, talking about the Penguins going up against the Vancouver Canucks tonight, Seattle Kraken on Thursday, Calgary Flames on Saturday, and Edmonton Oilers on Sunday. They currently sit nine points out of the wild card spot in the Eastern Conference, and seven points out of the Metropolitan Division's third position. Horwat, is this their toughest test of the season? Yeah, I think it's getting tougher because it's it's tougher because of the situation that they have now put themselves in. Uh, It is obviously the fact that the Vancouver Canucks are uh, among the top teams in the NHL uh, just straight up still, I believe. I'd have to check the standings again. Uh, but Seattle's done pretty well. They just beat Boston. Uh, we know Calgary is sort of in the middle of a sale, big sale, big yard sale. Uh, but, I mean, Edmonton, I mean, they're s- coming off that 16-game winning streak. It's not far removed from it. So uh, you got three of the four teams playing outstanding hockey and one of them who could just surprise you because they are having that sale, but they haven't sold everyone yet. They might by the time Pittsburgh gets there. Uh, they have a little bit of time. It could be a busy week for, for Calgary, but um, those are those are four teams that have talent and can, you know, uh, make life difficult. Yeah, and you obviously you know need to talk about when we're talking about this road trip what the Penguins are going into it without, and I think that's what makes it their toughest test of this season because it's a four game road trip, which when you go out to Western Canada and Seattle, it's a difficult road trip to begin with. You do that without forty or sorry. 40 goals, 24% of your total offense, that's going to make it even more difficult for one of the teams that is struggling to score the most in the National Hockey League this season, obviously referencing the fact that Jake Gensel, while he's with the team, cannot physically play in a game on this four-game road trip. He can only return on March 10th, which is two days after the NHL's trade deadline. And then you have Brian Rust, who got injured in Sunday's afternoon's game against the Philadelphia Flyers. He is not with the team Right now in Vancouver, he could return and could join the team eventually. That was not ruled out by Mike Sullivan yesterday at practice. But as the trip begins, you're without both Brian Rust and Jake Gensel in the lineup. That is, like I said, 40 of 166 goals or 24% of their offense. That is a huge blow for a Penguins team that is in need of stacking victories and not falling behind the eight ball. 
in need of stacking victories, in need of that offense. Uh, I mean, Brian Rust was kicking off, actually in the middle of, not even kicking off, in the middle of a really good heater, too. It's uh, He had three points in that game against Philadelphia before this injury happened. So uh, on top of having, I think it's 11 points in his last 11 games or you know, seven goals in that time, he's been crucial for the Penguins' recent success for whatever it may be. He's been a big part of it. Uh, and this, and when it comes down to it, the Penguins aren't getting offense from anyone, you know, fully healthy. Anyone outside of the top line. Well, now you you, you lose both wingers on that line. Uh, it's back to looking at Sidney Crosby and wondering what he can do mm-hmm. um, to keep bringing the offense. I, the Penguins started seeing a bit more of the depth chipping in. Valtteri Pustinen's been uh, really good. Drew O'Connor's on a three-game goal streak too. There's. There's been pieces below the first line that have started to really find a rhythm and contribute, but um, you take Emil Bremstrom's first game, not necessarily at a um, at a what you at a, you know with a great assault because of it was his first game it was against Philadelphia and that game was just nuts, hmm. but you know you understand that that is still a depth goal coming there, um, and then like I said, you put a lot of focus on that Drew O'Connor and. Well, Terry Poussin and pairing with Evgeny Malkin, maybe something can wake up there a little bit because those two have been really good. So you're getting this, the Penguins are getting the scoring from other areas, but it's not, it's got to remain consistent and continue showing up while they're out West. Yeah. And two of the names you didn't even mention there are the two names that are going to be flanking Sidney Crosby, at least to start this trip, which is Ricard Raquel and Riley Smith. We haven't seen Riley Smith play a whole lot with Sidney Crosby so far this season. So how that plays out is going to be interesting. Obviously, we know Ricard Raquel this season has only been good when he's next to Sidney Crosby, but he's also had his ups and downs when he's been on that line. So you need everybody to step up and make a substantial difference in their game to be able to create that offense, especially, I mean, tonight, They're going up against the Vancouver Canucks team that is number one in the National Hockey League in goals. You're not going to be able to win this game two to one. And if they do, then it's all going to be at the hands of Tristan Jari going back to British Columbia and being the Tristan Jari that we've seen him be most of this season, obviously outside of Sunday's game against the Philadelphia Flyers. But the offense needs to come from every single direction, and it needs to come, like you said, at a more consistent clip. Drew O'Connor scoring three games in a row is great, but is he going to be able to continue that high of a pace, which obviously not every single game, but is he going to continue to be able to create opportunities, create scoring chances, and create offense at the clip that he's been creating it at? That's what they're going to need because they're at without, like we said, two very, very important players to their team. And we've seen it from the blue line as well. Chris Letang, the last two games, has been very good at finding the back of the net. He's on a little bit of a heater himself. I think when you look at what Eric Carlson and Marcus Pedersen have done together in their three games together since everything switched, it's a lot more of an offense-heavy you know, focus for those two. So it's creating a little bit more in that way as well. You know, a lot of goals being scored by the Penguins over the last three games, but you know, it has come at the behest of some defense. And without Gensel, without Rust, you can say, yeah, the offense getting into high gear is a good thing, but that defense being the one thing you're leaving behind does get a little precarious because you never know when those finishing issues are going to crop back up for the Penguins because they've been one of the worst teams in the NHL the last three seasons in finishing. So if you're going to continue to try to win games four to three or ridiculously like seven to six on Sunday, it's going to be more and more difficult, especially as you lose that top tier talent that's going to get you the quote-unquote easy goals like a Jake Gensel or Brian Russ can get you because of their ability, their shot, and their finishing talent. Yeah, it's – it's they, they just need to find that finishing touch. They need to find that finishing ability somehow, some way. This team is still in the hunt. It's a bit of a long shot, but, I mean, they think they can do it, and you know Kyle Dubas is going to let them make that decision for him. They're going to let – He's going to let the team, if they're able to rattle off a couple more wins out West, suddenly it's suddenly the standings look a little more interesting. And suddenly your approach to the trade deadline look far more interesting. It's, I mean, they have the luxury of two more home games after going out West to um, really show what they're worth before going into March 8th. Uh, We'll have to see. I think a lot of decisions might be made before March 8th though. It's just a weird The way the schedule's laid out for the Penguins this year is a little interesting, but Mm -hmm. we'll see. Here's the way I look at, you know, what Kyle Dubas is looking at right now. And obviously everybody's heard he's taking calls on practically everybody that has divulged 
in the last week to certain names. Riley Smith has started to gain a lot of steam in the trade market. Ricard Raquel's name is starting to crop up a little bit more. Now we've heard from Elliot Friedman that the Penguins are taking calls on goaltenders, Tristan Jari and Alex Nedeljkovic, and we'll talk about that in our mailbag segment a little bit more. But here's the thing with, with Kyle Dubas. I feel like he's in a position where he wants to obviously get assets and get younger. He stated that last week. But here's what I believe he's really looking at. If you're going to offer for one of our players, we're not going to just give them up for nothing. We're not going to give them up for, you know, a fourth round pick here, maybe a fifth round pick there. They're looking to get deals that'll blow Kyle Dubas away, deals that the Penguins, even if it's Magic Beans, people will say, wow, that's a little bit much for those players. And that's for players like Jari. That's for players like Jay Gensel. That's for a player, I, I know Brian Russ's name has been thrown out there as potential, but again, no move clause in tow. That makes it a little bit more you know, unrealistic to expect yeah. that. But, you know, guys like Ricard Raquel, guys like Riley Smith, I think that he's going to look to offload those contracts, but you're going to have to get something substantial in return by way of like a mid-round draft pick. They're not going to get him for a conditional seventh. They're not going to give him away for a conditional sixth. And again, I feel like this is a deadline where he could be very busy, but that's if the other team's calling are giving him something that is interesting. I don't think he's just going to sell the farm just for the sake of selling the farm. Yeah, he wants to, he wants to fleece everyone he can. Like, let's just be, tell it like it most, is. He wants most, to, as most GM should. Yeah, ex absolutely. I, you're you're right. Like he's probably looking to sell off as many pieces as he can in terms of those undesirable players at the moment. Again, maybe they're just better off in new scenery, as in those Ricard Raquels or Riley Smiths. But if the return isn't also useful when it when it comes to the big names that are likely on the market. First of all, you have to remember also there's a lot of details going into this deadline. Duba said he hasn't asked anyone to waive trade clauses mm -hmm. or anything like that. Apparently, the Penguins aren't going to aren't going to ask. They're just going to try and work around them, which slims the list of teams that players can move to. But that doesn't make it impossible. You just kind of have to now find the right combinations. Um, it also likely means Brian Russ is here to stay because he's got the full no move, not a modified. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's about finding the good return. Like Jay Kensel, you're likely going to look for someone who can help now, especially if you trade Jay Kensel and you still plan on going for it, which good luck, but it, you never know. You get someone who can contribute to the NHL roster this year and then – tack on you regain your first round pick maybe a prospect uh when it comes to deals involving guys like riley smith and ricard raquel though i it, he of course kyle dubas is gonna want to try and fleece a gm but those will be harder to do because especially in raquel's case that's a long contract still remaining it's a lot of money for not a lot of production right now you have to really sell them on the change of scenery mm -hmm. um and for riley smith this is a if Brian Russ cannot play tonight. This is a good little audition tape for maybe going back to Vegas, maybe <laughs> going back to Florida, maybe going back to Dallas. Every former team of his could just be an option. <laughs> Yeah, they're all obviously in position to go for a Stanley Cup this year. But it's interesting that the trade deadline is really at, at the point where they're not really full on buyers and they're not really full on mm -hmm. sellers. And it's it's weird because any given day that could completely change with Kyle Dubas. If they get killed tonight by the Vancouver Canucks, you could look at it and he says, all right, well, maybe I should trade away one of these players. Maybe I should trade away two of these players. Or he could say, you know what? I'm going to give him another shot, which he's been doing time and time again. And they could go out there and, and win the next three. And he could say, you know what? I might not do anything. Might just leave these guys the way they are and might try to recoup some assets in the off season. But the next week, I think it's hard for anybody to pinpoint what he's going to do just simply because, you know, he's been so patient with this team. And he said it last week, when they're at their best, the Penguins can contend with any team on the ice. They can play and beat any team any given night on the ice, but they're just not built to do that consistently. And that is a very difficult situation because you know the talent is there. You know the ability is there to be one of the premier teams in the league or at the very least be one of the top 16 to get into the playoffs and potentially be an upset underdog favorite. Mm -hmm. Underdog favorite's an oxymoron, but underdogs that could be very intriguing going into the playoffs, but they yeah, just don't do it on a consistent basis. Like tonight is their first opportunity to win 
or their opportunity to win three games in a row for the first time in 2024. It's the end of February. Yeah. They haven't won three games in a row. That's not that high of a bar to clear, but they've beaten some very good teams in very convincing manner. So it's very interesting. Now they could be in line for a good trip. The last Western road trip that they went on in the far West and obviously discounting the fact that they went to Vegas and Arizona, but the far West, the solid 10 o'clock, three or more game starts. They had that early November trip to California. This feels like a similar trip. The Penguins are in desperate need of a solid four game swing here. Last time they went out there early November, they were three, six and zero to start the season. They went three Oh and on that trip, which was part of a five game win streak, which is the highest of the season. Not only that, the Penguins right now are two Oh and Oh, since that Dubas press conference last Wednesday. The last time he had that press conference, we all know they went 7-2-1 and one in the following 10 games. So are they on the cusp of a very solid road trip? If you believe in narratives, yes. If you believe in just looking at the team on the ice, I think that's a little bit harder of a sell. But hey, the narrative is there for them to have a good road trip. It's there. It's lining up. It's that post post GM presser heater. Yeah. It's like it's like getting a new coach except the Islanders aren't experiencing that. No, they are not. <laughs> we gain that little bit of a heater and the bonus and not maybe not a bonus, but the interesting little tidbit that's going to go into this 10 o'clock game for the Penguins is uh, a couple of teams ahead of them will have wrapped up contests uh, mm -hmm. by the time puck drops in Vancouver. Uh, Philadelphia plays at seven against Tampa Bay. Detroit and Washington play against each other um, at seven in Detroit. So those, I mean, Detroit not as much anymore because they're kind of pulling away in that wild card positioning. But Washington being right there is uh, everyone in the Metro starting to really look to fight for third because the wild card might be locked up by two Atlantic teams. Um, and that's going to make things interesting. But those two teams, those three teams at least, by uh, battling out at seven before the Penguins even drop their bucket to 10. Oh, and the Devils play tonight as well, 1030 in San yeah. Jose. So a lot of scoreboard watching is starting. If you ask when it comes to also what these players feel, going back to one of your earlier points here, if you ask any of these players, they're going to look at what the Florida Panthers did last year. They mm. squeezed in and went on a run. Sid's already said it himself too. Just look what the Panthers did last year. Why couldn't the Penguins be part of that? Slipping in at the very end if they need to, taking a wild card spot and then – catching fire at the right time yeah. it's anything's possible as long as the penguins as long as they're not selling and tearing things to the nuts and bolts mm -hmm. there's still a chance they can make it and i do also have to hold on to my same point from last year so i don't sound like a fraud some playoffs is better than none yeah that's a hundred percent something you've you've stayed on and honestly you have to, you yeah. know, when they make the comparisons to the panthers my issue with that is the Panthers are built a little bit more for, for playoff hockey than the Penguins are. But again, like you said, oh, yeah, <laughs> there's always a chance. There's always a chance. I would put that chance very little or very low, but I've been proven wrong in the past. We'll see what they're able to do here on this four game road trip out in Western Canada. And of course in Seattle, Washington, but let's take a break after that. We'll get to our mailbag. A lot of questions. Thank you so much for sending them in. We'll get to it right after this one. Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com. We got a doubleheader mailbag for you today, obviously, as the Penguins are out west. I was on vacation over the last couple of days, so I did not pay too close of attention. The Penguins still had an eye on some of the games, but let's get to a mailbag because this is some overarching discussion about the Penguins, where they're at, especially with the trade deadline coming up here in about a week and a half. Let's start with the Ohio Pens fan asking, is there a realistic chance the Penguins can change up enough of the roster from now to the start of next season for them to actually have one more run? Horwat, I'll let you lead off with this one. Uh, I'd say once an offseason gets involved in turning over a roster, anything is possible. Uh, we saw what Kyle Dubas could do in his first summer in Pittsburgh. It was, um, I forget what the number was. It was like 11 or 12 new faces were entering uh, training camp. Uh, it's anything is possible once an offseason gets involved. So I would say yes, that he could very well rebuild the team into a 
better unit uh, going into next season. Uh, it might take a lot of moving and shaking, but uh, once you have that sort of time, that th- those no games and um, a bit more, you know, bit more money up, financial opportunities in terms of the salary cap possibly increasing, certain guys coming off the books, and also maybe you're selling before that point even happens. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say, yeah, that's very possible because you have that sort of time and money and effort to really put into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that sentiment. I think the short answer is yes. This team as constructed is not built to play consistent hockey. But as I mentioned in the first segment, they are built to play some pretty good hockey at points. And they've been, you know, challenging some of the better teams in the National Hockey League at certain points. So goal one has to be to fix the power play. And I think part of that isn't even really fixing the personnel out there on the ice. Part of that is a new coach this offseason. And that might be one of the first orders of business for Kyle Dubas is they need a better support staff surrounding Mike Sullivan because Mike Volucci, as well as he's done with the penalty kill, the forwards are, again, for the third straight year, one of the worst forward units when it comes to finishing. And that's falls squarely on his shoulders. So maybe they go out and get somebody new for the offensive side of things with Mike Bellucci's spot. And then of course there's Todd Reardon, who everybody has discussed. Everybody has asked why he hasn't been fired as of yet. And from the looks of it, he's not going to get fired anytime soon, yeah. but you would have to imagine, especially if his contract does indeed run out this season. But again, uh, you know, he signed a two year extension two years ago. Is this the last year of his contract? That's something that I don't think we are, have, you know, access to or readily, you know, available to have that access to. But, you know, I would imagine that if the power play continues it the way it's going, not to mention the fact that the defense has been poor for the second consecutive season, I would imagine that they go out and try to get somebody else to coach the power play or at least try something else on the power play in the offseason. It's it's similar to the Pittsburgh Steelers offensive thing. You can try to make some changes in season, but you're not going to make an overarching change at the drop of a hat in the middle of a run for the playoffs. Like it's not going to happen this season. But in the offseason, maybe they change certain things and maybe that gets the power play going. And with the power play, as you've mentioned, Horwat, as everybody has seemingly mentioned, mm-hmm. with the power play, if it would be at a league average pace, this team would be sitting in a playoff spot on this day. I think that much is clear. So, you know, fixing the power play gets them into that position with a whole off off season. As you mentioned with more money, if they can especially sell some pieces at the deadline, I think it is certainly possible that they can turn and be one of the top three teams in the Metro throughout next season, potentially, especially if Sidney Crosby, Chris Letang play at the level that they have this season. If Eric Carlson settles in, plays a little bit better. And if Evgeny Malkin bounces back, which we've seen him do multiple times in his career, the people have counted him out, said that, you know, father time had gotten to him and he's come back and had great seasons in the past. So that's not off the table in my mind either. So I, I agree with you. I, I think that the short answer to this question was yes. And as I delved into there a little bit longer, I think there are multiple ways that you can get to that assumption, get to that place. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, when you have the time and the effort, there's plenty of room for improvement. Yeah. And I think part of that improvement is you know, making sure that there are better decisions made when it comes to the lineup. And we got asked this question a couple of different times. So we're going to obviously address it here. Duke Marriott and Evie Pooh both said on different platforms, why is Jansen Harkins in the lineup over Yesapul Yarvi? And I think the better question would just be, why is Jansen Harkins in the lineup? to be completely honest for what. So I'll, I'll leave that to you uh, to kick us off with that one as well. And I couldn't tell you, I <laughs> could not tell you. I don't know who he knows uh, because not only is he in the lineup, I feel like he's all over the penguins, social media at all times too. Yeah, I, That's just me. I, I feel like he is just everywhere from the moment he was remember, early in the season before the season started. I think he had just gotten to Pittsburgh after being claimed off of waivers. And this is just like a social media thing. So it doesn't matter. But he he was a prominent fixture in the, um, like it, they were doing like a dog calendar campaign, and his, mm-hmm. his face was the first one everyone saw. <laughs> yeah, it's no this guy apparently. That's a side point though. I don't know why he's in the lineup. To be fair, uh, it's, it's just one of those Sullivan guys. It's got some mm-hmm. speed to him. Plays with a little bit of a little bit of grit, I guess. I mean, he pops Jamie Drysdale's shoulder out. Yikes! But I. I, I, other than having that little bit of speed and creating a some sort of steadiness to the fourth line, I really don't know what else there is. He hasn't scored yet this season, and we're nearing the trade deadline. When you don't have any goals nearing that that you know date of uh, conf, uh, nearing that date, 
that's tough for anyone, even defensemen. Even it's not an ideal situation for the Penguins to have. Man, I, I like this. Some of these questions ask why Jesse Puljujarvi isn't in over him. Again, I don't know. Maybe there's because of the left wing, the right wing thing. Not sure, but I I got nothing for Jansen Harkins still being in the lineup anymore. Now here's the thing. Jansen Harkins now is much better than Jake, Jansen Harkins was at the beginning of the season. I'll give him that. He's sure. certainly playing a higher level of hockey, certainly looking a little bit more like an NHL talent, whereas at the beginning of the season, I don't think there was any question that it didn't look like he was up to speed at the NHL level. I think he's gotten to that point. But still, when you look at a guy like, in my opinion, Jesse Pugliarvi, I think that he gives you the exact same things with a little bit of a higher ceiling. So I'm not exactly sure why the Penguins have continued to keep Jansen Harkins over a guy like Yesapul Yarvi in the lineup. Now, over a guy like Matt Phillips, it makes sense. I don't think Matt Phillips fits the identity of the fourth line that you have out there, but I think Yesapul Yarvi, he plays physically, he has some decent speed, he has some size, and he plays that 200-foot defensively responsible game. I would imagine that that fits with Nola Chari. That fits with Jeff Carter. So I don't understand why you're continuously putting Jansen Harkins out there. Now, again, the answer in Mike Sullivan's eyes is probably, and this is not what he said. This is what I'm assuming he would say, not his, his words, but I put the best lineup out there to give us the best opportunity every night to win. He thinks Jansen Harkins gives him a better chance than yes, a Pugliarvi. I just don't understand why, like you mentioned, 38 games played for Jansen Harkins this season, zero goals, four assists. Z- now, yes, a Pugliarvi, zero points in six games, but I think what you saw there was a higher ceiling, a higher upside, and at least the eye test looked much better with Paul Yarvi than it ever has with Jansen Harkins. And even the underlying numbers are a little bit better for Paul Yarvi as well. But I just, I don't understand taking out Paul Yarvi after two poor performances where we have seen stretches from Jansen Harkins where he might have been the best option at the time. I just feel like at this moment, Paul Yarvi is a better option for the Penguins. Now, this is a moot point at this moment simply because of the injuries. Pugliarvi is going to get back in the lineup or is at least expected to get back in the lineup tonight against Vancouver. But when Brian Rust comes back, if he rejoins the team on this trip, when Jake Gensel comes back, if he does come back after the deadline and is still with the Penguins, I don't see a reason for Harkins to be higher on the depth chart than Pugliarvi just in general. My mic was on mute. Yeah, I don't see too much of that either. Um, just someone's got to step up. I mean, you also have to remember that there's a Matthew Phillips floating around down there as well. It's <clears throat> the Penguins have these. Whenever we entered the season, we discussed the idea that Kyle Dubas really built up this depth with some good NHL quality pieces. That you know, there was the discussions of you know Alex Nylander was down there, Colin White was down there. Whoops, whoops, both of them are gone now. But I feel like at this stage of the game neither of them were really options for the penguins at the nhl level like i feel like alex nylander ran out of his opportunity in pittsburgh and colin white you could argue that he ran out of his opportunity when he was still on the ice yeah it's he didn't it's hard to judge these guys when they're just floating around on the fourth line though Mm. um whereas phillips listen again nothing against matthew phillips it's every time he's on the ice though there's just bigger dudes just pushing him around because they can. And I don't know if there's ways for him to get around that, but there's that's a little aspect that I've noticed in his couple of games at the NH, at, with the Penguins. Um, I'd like to see him get more opportunity even too. And I always, I always want to see fresher faces get fresher opportunities than guys like Jansen Harkins who have just been sitting around. But – the, if the Penguins are going for that playoff push, they got to find the pieces that work right now. Mm-hmm. And if Paul Yarvey didn't work in his six games, then okay, fine. You pull the plug for now. You have him for another year, though. I think maybe not even pull the plug, but you understand that there needs to be a different. I don't know. I I, I can't build the depth of this roster because it's mm-hmm. all not working. Yeah. I think Paul Yarvey might just need that time to mold in. I bet he pops off next year and has a great year. But again, yeah. that's not what we're here to worry about. Yeah, and here's, you know, the big thing in what you said there is, you know, try to give, you pull the plug for now and because it wasn't working at the time. 
where was that with Harkins? Like there has been so much faith, so many opportunities for Jansen Harkins, yet Puljujarvi has two bad games after having four fairly decent games, and he's out of the lineup for a handful of days. I don't know. I just, I just, That's... I don't understand that. I don't understand the the thought process behind it. But again, you know, all we can do is react to what we've seen. From what I've seen, yes, Puljujarvi in those six games gave the Penguins a better chance. Even at a fourth line role, if you put them there, then Jansen Harkins does at this point. I think there's physicality there. I think there's yeah. size there. I think there's speed there. I think he has everything that Jansen Harkins has, but I think he has a higher higher ceiling. So I'm not exactly sure why Harkins continues to get these opportunities. And I, again, that might be repetitive, but it's just it, it's something that I, I I'm baffled by by the amount of opportunities that Harkins has, has received. Now, yeah. He's, he's gotten better, but yeah, and that's why I want to know what dirt Harkins has on somebody. Yeah, like, that's exactly. why I want that's to know. how you started this whole thing. And it's also possible that because Poyarvi's only been getting chances on the third line, maybe they're treating it as if it's like a minor league call up where they don't want to stick him on the fourth. But that but he doesn't got make sense. On the second line too. That too, but but that also doesn't make sense to only hold him to those to the middle six. Yeah, give him a shot on the fourth, see if things work out because that fourth line is not useless. But my God, they're not scoring it damn thing no i mean the penguins are undefeated when jeff carter scores but he just doesn't score nearly enough for that to be a stat that is actually substantial in this season it's one yeah. of my favorite stats of this season but you know he has what six goals this year and i think he has two multi-goal games or something like that but yeah. you need more from your fourth line when it comes to offense and this goes back to what we talked about in the first segment is with these two guys out and brian rust and jake gensel you need scoring to come from everywhere yeah. nola chari has not been providing scoring Jeff Carter, very little. And Jansen Harkins, zero. Zero. And I, I think the eye test would be fairly obvious that Pugliarvi gives you more of a chance to score goals in the bottom six and in the fourth line. But, you know, that's something that we'll just have to keep an eye on. He'll get back in the lineup tonight. Maybe if he performs well with this opportunity to get back in the lineup with the injuries, then he'll stay in the lineup when people get healthy. But, you know, that is something just to monitor. That's that's trying to predict the future, and that's not something that uh, we can do all the time. But we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, part two of our mailbag to close things out here on the tip of the iceberg. Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by InsideThePenguins.com. We continue our mailbag. This is part two of our two-part mailbag here on Tuesday. Thank you to everybody for submitting your questions. We're not going to get to everybody's question, but we're going to try to potentially filter some in on Thursday as well and, and try to make sure we get to everybody's question here in the next couple of days. Evie, Paul, uh, Evie Poo, excuse me, also asked, why is Ty Smith not being given a chance? So too did Hockey 28, but there was more to Hockey 28's question that we'll get to in a minute. Let's start with the Ty Smith of it all. Why has he not gotten a chance at the NHL level this season, Horwat? Uh, I think just because there's too many players on the left side. I, other than that, maybe he's just not a Kyle Dubas guy. This could be as easy as that as well. This is Kyle Dubas, the one kind of making those calls of who's coming up and down in the mm -hmm. in the uh, <clears throat> in the uh, organization in the franchise. It's, you know, I, I don't know what else he would bring to the lineup other than obviously the touch of offense. Um, it's There's just been too much cluster on the left side, as in Marcus Patterson having a great year. Um, as I run down, Ryan Graves not having a great year, but being there and consistently, you know, you're not going to send him to the minors. You're not, they don't plan on healthy scratching him at any time soon, it seems. Uh, P.O. Joseph floating around. John Ludwig's a left shot despite playing both sides pretty often. Um, Ryan Shea was also a left shot for a while. There's There was just more um, traffic in front of Ty Smith. I'd say that's the easy answer. The long answer might be much more complicated that we don't know about. Mm. Um, but I think, it, I think on the surface, it's likely just going to boil down to quite a bit of surplus on the left side, plus just not being a Kyle Dubas guy. How many puck carrying defensemen do you need? Yeah. That's that's what it comes down to. You're not going to pair him with Chris Letang. You're not going to pair him with Eric Carlson. And all of a sudden you're saying, all right, now you have to argue for that third pairing role. 
Ryan Graves is there right now. And Ryan yeah. Graves is at his best. And we've said it so many times since Jesse Marshall told us. He's at his best when the puck is on his stick and he's the one carrying the puck out of the zone. So you put Ryan Graves, or sorry, you put Ty Smith up there. He takes that away. And then Smith has to either play without the puck or Graves has to play without the puck. Either way, you're not utilizing either of them to the best of their ability. And you mentioned it as well. You know, John Ludwig has gotten an opportunity. Ryan Shea, P.O. Joseph, Chad Ruedel. It's just too busy up there. For a guy that has little to no defensive impact, or at least positive defensive impact, and a little bit of offensive upside. Because the Penguins already have offensive defensemen. They already have Latang. They already have Carlson. They already have people that are going to run their power play. They might run it into the ground, but they're going to run their power play nonetheless. They're not going to choose Ty Smith over guys like that, which, yeah, it might be disappointing, especially considering who you traded for him to get. I mean, you traded John Marino, who right now would be probably on your second pairing with uh, a guy like Eric Carlson, and you'd probably have Pedersen up there with, with Chris Latang, and you'd probably be looking at a much better defense. But at the end of the day, I just I don't think Ty Smith, it's similar to what we've seen with Alex Nylander. It's similar to what we've seen with Colin White. The opportunity is just not there anymore for Ty Smith at the NHL level with the Penguins. He's probably going to need a fresh start, and that's probably going to come at the behest of leaving this organization. Yeah, yeah, there's no doubt about that. It's just not going to fit here. We, we, we went into this season, I can remember us discussing the idea of what the what the top six defenders would look like. Mm-hmm. I think we put Ty Smith in that conversation at first and looked at that and went, oh, who's playing defense here? Because yeah. it would have consisted of like Crystal Tang, Eric Carlson, Ty Smith would have been up there. We probably had P.O. Joseph in that conversation. Marcus Pedersen, this was Marcus Pedersen conversation before this season started. Mm. Uh, and Ryan Graves. We were truthfully wondering, oh, who's playing defense here? Just Ryan Graves and Marcus Pedersen? Mm. Turns out only one of them really knows how to play defense. So yikes. So yeah, it, once again, that's the other part of it too, is you want your defenseman to know how to play the position mm-hmm. or at least maybe half of them, maybe four of them at least. And mm-hmm. uh, he, I, not that he doesn't know how to play defense, but it's just not at the same sort of ilk, I guess. I mean, with Alex Nylander gone, he's the leading scorer in Wilkes-Barre. Mm-hmm. So I, when your defenseman is leading your team in scoring, I look at the 4 sorry, the... Oh three, oh four, Penguins. It's ugly. Yeah, yeah. And with Ty Smith, I, I think we both saw that he had an opportunity in training camp, and we both talked about it probably at nauseum. I, I would say we talked about it a good bit about how Ty Smith could get an opportunity on the third pairing, how it could be his time with a guy like Chad Ruedel, or you know, we, we were talking about P.O. Joseph because we thought Joseph was going to be much better, but also. What we didn't know was Ty Smith was going to go out and be outperformed by three or four other defensemen in training camp. He was outperformed by Mark Pesic before Pesic got oh, the yeah. So yep. he was so far down in the depth chart. That's where he started the season that just because he's scoring at a, a really good clip down at the AHL doesn't mean that it, there's necessarily opportunity for him at the NHL. Now, could he be a good six defenseman for another team in the future? Yeah. Could he be a six defenseman for the Penguins in the future? Maybe, especially if they choose to move on from a guy like P.O. Joseph, if they think Ryan Shea's experiment kind of outlasted itself, does he move up that depth chart because of the departure of some of these guys? Potentially, but I don't think there's any space for him this season. I think it's simply because he started so far at the bottom of the depth chart in the organization for the Penguins, and his ability to play defense is not enough to, you know, get him over guys like a P.O. Joseph, like a John Ludwig, especially like a Chad Ruedel, who is in the second part of this question from Hockey 28, who asks, what's your opinion on P.O.J. playing on the first pair with Chris Letang? That's an interesting, an interesting thing to look at right now because it's been three games, and I think what we talked about, whatever that first that move was first made, was this is an option and probably their, their only real pull the massive lever option to try to balance out this blue line because Ryan Graves in the top four with one of Carlson or Latang just wasn't working. And if you're going to move him down, who do you really have faith in pushing up in the lineup? The answer was only really P.O. Joseph. Yeah. You can say John Ludwig, but his defensive ability is just not enough to play the amount of minutes that it takes to play with a, a Carlson with a Latang. Joseph looked good last year in that role. So far this year, it hasn't been pretty but they've been bailed out a little bit by the goaltenders. Oh, have they ever? They've been bailed out by goaltending all season, and it's gotten them so far. Mm-hmm. Um, how do I feel about P.O. Joseph, though? I think it's fine. I don't... I don't it's a Band-Aid. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, and it's not it's not necessarily covering a bullet hole either. It is you know a, a smaller issue than we might foresee it to be because Marcus Patterson could easily slip right back up there and cover. Um, but then you're adjusting where your scar is. Uh, yeah. It's I don't know I, I I can't bring myself to worry too much about it um, because Pio Joseph is an NHL player. It, it was just a shockingly big jump. I think that was kind of the, oh, well, hello, it's P.O. Joseph back in the lineup, and he's on the first line. You know, from a healthy scratch to the first line, that's a bit of a large uh, step to take. Mm-hmm. But again, it was something we had seen before and seen seen impressive outcomes from before. So mm-hmm. I, don't, I didn't think too much of it. I enjoy that there's some stability there in terms of what these six players will look like, barring an injury of sort. So... I think it's uh, I think it's perfectly fine. I mean, it's not going to stand out for you. It's not going to, uh, mm-hmm. you know, move the needle. But it's fine. Yeah, right now they have fifty two percent of the shot attempts at five on five, and they're outscoring opponents four to two when on the ice. But I think the big thing you look at is the expected goals thirty four percent of the expected goals, forty one percent of the scoring chances. It's been ugly, but the good thing is, like I said, goaltenders have been bailing them out. Penguins goaltenders have an on ice save percentage of nine thirty one when those two are on the ice. So they're getting good goaltending. You look down at the other two pairings, they're not getting as good of goaltending. The Pedersen Carlson unit has an 857 on ice save percentage and the Graves and Ruedel unit has a 750 on ice save percentage. So obviously it's nice when P.O. Joseph and Chris Letang are getting great goaltending and their numbers are a little bit better because of that. You look at the Pedersen Carlson pairing, what it's done exactly what it's been designed to do. It's created a more safe environment for Eric Carlson to be himself. 60% of the shot attempts, five to three lead in goals, 61% of the expected goals, 60% of the scoring chances. That's great. That's what you want from him, but it has to come, you know, at the expense of Chris Letang having a partner that he can also do the same thing with. Now Letang has scored a lot in the last couple of games, but you look at the overarching picture. The third pairing is still horrible with Graves and, and Rue Weedle but you're at least getting a little bit more out of Carlson. And that's what the Penguins are trying to do. That's the exchange yeah. they wanted to make. They needed Carlson at a higher level because the defense has been poor all season. So what's making the defense a little bit worse to get a little bit more offense out of Eric Carlson. That's, that's the gamble and that's the risk the Penguins took and, and they're getting, I'm not going to say the results they want. They probably want a little bit better results as far as underlying numbers from the first and third pairing, but they're getting results that they probably were hoping to get when it comes to getting Carlson to be a little bit better and still staying in games when it comes to the defensive side of the puck. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> they just expected maybe a touch more from Eric Carlson and they had to give him a player that's going to, that was going to get it out of him. And that yeah, right now is Marcus Patterson. So uh, just a good little, just, it was just a sacrifice mm-hmm. and a, decent trade-off now i want to get to this question it's not going to take too long to answer in my opinion because i don't think it's close when it comes particularly just based on my opinion what i'm seeing nobu obayashi on youtube asks what's more pressing a top six goal scoring winger or a top six center that can play third line center and or step in for malkin as a second line center i'm going to say it's a top six winger and it's not even close uh do you agree with that i think it depends on what direction this team wants to go in tell you what yeah, because if because if they are looking to just sell it off, I'd say then maybe it's that third line center because maybe you're looking into or sorry that that center because then you are kind of looking into well what could this player bring for the rest of the season? What could they maybe take into next season if that time comes where it's time to adjust Malkin's position? Mm-hmm. Um, if they're looking to go for it, then they're going to need a top six winger. So. I, the answer to that is both on my end, sadly, but again, it just depends on what direction this team wants to go in. We're o- just under, a, sorry, just over a week away from the trade deadline and they still really don't know. So yeah, uh, it's, that's a tough one right now. Like you said, it's not going to be hard to, or super long to answer, but I'd say it just depends on what direction the team wants to go in. Mm-hmm. They're not going to get either in the next week and a half. That's yeah, pretty simple. much, but I think it's obviously a top single, six wingers simply because what would Evgeny Malkin look like this season with a competent or simply more consistent wingers by his side? Do I think that he would have still looked like he took a step back potentially, but I don't think it would be as drastic as people are saying. And I already said in this episode that in the past he has had down seasons and bounced back to have 
dominant years and good years and very solid years. And we look at as recent as last year, people were saying going into that contract, why would you do it? This isn't a guy that one can stay healthy, can play 82 games in a season. And two, he's not a guy that's going to age gracefully. He had 83 points in 82 games last season. Is that going to continue next year? Do I expect him to be a over point per game player? No, but I do think with better line mates, he produces at a second line center rate. And I also think when you look at the wingers, you might be without Gensel after the trade deadline. You might be looking to fill that hole. You have Ricard Raquel who hasn't performed up to snuff. You have Riley Smith who hasn't performed up to snuff. You could be going into next season with the only top six winger that played like a top six winger this season being Brian Rust. So that to me creates the desperate need and the more pressing need, which was the question, what's more pressing? I think it has to be top six wingers because at the end of the day, Evgeny Malkin, I'm not willing to say he's entirely cooked simply because he hasn't been given a lot of help this season. Mm -hmm. And he's shown in the past, and again, repeating myself over and over on this episode, he's shown in the past that he can defy the odds and he can bounce back in a big way sometimes. I think he might have one of those left in him if he's given the proper help, which he hasn't been this season. So I would say more pressing is certainly the top six winger. And also because you're paying Evgeny Malkin $6 million, you're paying Sidney Crosby $8.7 million. To get that second, third line center, it's going to cost you a lot of money, and you're not going to really be able to get them anybody, and you're going to be back in the same position that you are this season. But let's finish this off with a question about the Penguins goaltenders. Joshua Carnes asks, if the Penguins sell high now on Tristan Jari and get out of that five-year deal that we all questioned over the summer to keep Jake Gensel, which would you choose? Uh, I think I'm keeping Tristan Jari around. Mm. Enjoyed what I've seen from him this year. Jay Gensel, not not, a, not as essentially gone at this point, but is you know it seems way more likely um, in either direction the Penguins want to go that Jay Gensel is getting traded before the tenth, uh, or sorry, before, well before the tenth, but also before a trade deadline on the eighth. Um, and I just think Jari will. I just feel like Jari's got more of a steady future in this team because there's a, I don't know. I, that's just my answer. That's my gut feeling, I guess. Just that um, Tristan Jari is probably the better case here. Uh, Jake Gensel could fetch the Penguins a return that could be beneficial and extremely useful. Mm hmm. Now, I also think Tristan Jari's return would also be extremely beneficial and useful for the Penguins. But yeah, here's my thing on the goaltending situation. If you trade Tristan Jari, you're trading because there's a market for goaltenders right now. A lot of teams, especially teams that are going to go for a chase at the Stanley Cup, a lot of teams that are in the chase for the playoffs, they want goaltenders. They need goaltenders. There's a lack of top-tier goalies in the NHL. How are you going to replace that next year? If you're willing to if you want to go back and try to go on another run, how are you going to replace that? And when you have Jake Gensel that you could say, yeah, you resign him, you'd get him, you'd be able to sign Jake Gensel with that money. You'd also need to use that money on bringing in another goaltender yeah. because a lot of people like what Alex Nedeljkovic has done. You're not going to be able to win with Alex Nedeljkovic and Joel Blomqvist next year. It's not going to happen. That is not a good plan for next season. You could win with Alex Nedeljkovic and Tristan Jari again next season. I could see that happening. But I think the problem being there are so many people that take for granted the season that Tristan Jari is having this season that they're saying, well, he's at his all-time high, which is 100% correct. He is probably at the most, I would say, valuable that he has ever been, especially with the market the way it is for goaltenders. But you're going to need something if you're not completely tearing it down. And I don't think anything Kyle Dubas has mentioned over the past what, nine months now, eight months, whatever it's been since he took over, that leads us to believe that he's willing to completely tear it down anytime in the next year or so, or really anytime when Sidney Crosby is on the roster, but specifically right now. So I don't think you trade away a goaltender who right now is 11th in the league in goals against. He's 15th in the league in save percentage, first in shutouts and 13th in goal save above expected. All of that with one of the worst, or at least a bottom third defense in the National Hockey League and a team that doesn't have a good power play that typically gives up more shorthanded chances than creates power play opportunities. I think when you look at the job he's done, I think you have to say that the goaltending position takes priority over a guy in Jake Gensel who you could sign him and he could be a 40-goal scorer for the next couple of years, but at the end of the day, what have we seen in the last couple of years? Even when the Penguins had a good team two years ago when they were going up against the Rangers, what killed them? 
Tristan Jari and goaltending wasn't at their best. Now it's weird because it's the same guy that has changed his narrative over the course of the season, but you need goaltending to do anything in this league. And the quickest way from going from this team that is inconsistent and is fighting for a playoff spot to a team that is safely in the playoffs and trying to go for a Stanley cup. The one thing you need more than everything else is consistent goaltending to get to that ultimate goal of a Stanley cup and Tristan Jari right now, while yes, at $5 million for five years, we thought that it was too long of a contract for him, but that is a good number. And if he's playing at this level, that is a great person and player to have locked up for your team. So I would stick with Tristan Jari in that instance. And, and the other question and the other part of that question comes to it saying uh, from Jessica Lynn on YouTube, what are the Pens best options for a goalie and or the return? If they do indeed try to trade Jari, which I think would be a misstep. And I think, you know, most people would would tend to agree that you would have to get something ridiculous in return. It would have to start with a first round pick and a top prospect in this market. One hundred percent. Yeah, it's a hot goalie market. Absolutely. I also just feel like if you're if the Penguins are trading a goalie, they're going Alex Nedeljkovic first. Yes, uh, because less contract stability. It's uh, almost a foregone conclusion he might be gone next year anyway. Mm. You just kind of see what return you can get. Um, that for just, I mean, if you're trading Jari though, if that's really what you're doing, uh, yeah, absolutely. You try and recoup an asset in terms of a draft pick, a high one and some sort of good prospect at least. Uh, and you know, you don't want to say it's similar to what, the, to what Gensel might get, because I feel like Gensel might gain a bit, a bigger return. Oh yeah. But goaltending is a more important position without mm -hmm. doubt. Goaltending is the most important position in the sport. Um, with and like everything you laid out, without that consistent goaltending, you cannot compete. Whereas you, you're the Penguins have a good goalie right now in Tristan Jari. If things were going better in front of him, his record would look much better. His numbers, I think, are fine. I don't think you need to worry about the numbers too much. Scoring is way up this year, mm -hmm. just not for the Penguins. So if the scoring, if the Penguins forward core and even the defensive core were following along in that uh, offensive production that the league is seeing, you know, like I said, Jari's backing numbers are fine. I think the record could use some help and that's about it. But you know, you get some power play goals in there. You get some more finishing ability in front of him, and maybe a touch better defense. And suddenly his, I believe he's below 500. He's increasing over 500 mm -hmm. without doubt with just a couple of, with just a little bit of help in front of him. So I'd, and also I'd say that at this point, the goalie controversy is just about gone. This is Jari's net now. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's, that's, it's pretty settled. It's from what it looks like. It looks to be Jari's net. And the second part of that question was best options going forward. We both mentioned that Nadelkovic, or you mentioned it, that Nadelkovic could be gone next season, regard irregardlessly or whatever. Uh, <laughs> I agree with that. Uh, I, I think that he's pricing himself out. He's certainly earning himself a decent contract next year. He's performed well as the one B slash backup for the Penguins. I don't know if the Penguins are going to be able to retain him, but it's specifically if they move Jari out in that instance. You know, they'd have to retain either him or they could go to the market, but the best options are all restricted free agents. So are you going to put down an offer sheet that happens very rarely? Or are these guys, are these other teams going to allow these guys to walk? I don't think so. Like Jeremy Swayman is another name that's going to be an RFA once again this season. Is he going to be allowed to walk by, by Boston? Are they going to try to figure something out longer term with their younger goaltender? Uko Pekka Lukanen, I, I think, has had a really good season for Buffalo. He's had some hot starts. He's had some hot games. He's had some hot stretches, but he's also an RFA. What do the Buffalo Sabres do? Their goaltending situation is interesting with him and Devin Levi. Marc-Andre Fleury, if he doesn't retire, is on the, on the market there. He's having a down season. So are you really going to trade away a guy in Tristan Jari and bring in a Marc-Andre Fleury that who knows if he's even going to be at a high yeah. enough level to be a starter next year or if he is a 1B backup type of player like you know Alex Nadelkovic is this season the only other name there that really caught my attention is Jonathan Quick because of the season he's having but again are the Rangers going to let him go especially because he took a hometown discount to go there in the first place he loves the Rangers he's been great for them this season why would he go anywhere else the only other option is in in-house which is Joel Blankfist and he's certainly not going to be able to be relied upon to be a starter next season he might not even be a backup level next season. Who knows where his progression takes him? So I don't think there's enough options out there to warrant saying, all right, we're going to trade away Tristan Jari and try to restart the goaltending thing again after last offseason where you had to have all these questions and the answer was still Tristan Jari. 
Let's also not forget that when you bring up Joel Blomquist, that Elliot Freeman mentioned all three goalies in terms of who might be moved. Like that included Blomquist. Sadly, I don't. It, that's not happening. I don't. You, think that's uh, happening. You, you might be right about that. Um, but if they're put it this way, I would say the if the Penguins are trading a goalie, they're going to trade one. They're not going to trade multiple. No. Uh, it would just be one. So if they're committing to committing to Jari and then maybe searching or maybe even committing to both Jari and Adelkovich into the next couple of seasons. At that point, does Joel Blomquist become uh, expendable? Mm. You know, if they are going to allow Alex Adelkovich to be traded, then yeah, you got to keep Blomquist around. If they're going to trade Jari, then that's a completely different can of worms, but then that's showing your commitment to Joel Blomquist in the very near future. Mm-hmm. So I would say if a goalie is going anywhere, it's going to be just one, not all three. Um, and I wouldn't rule out Blomquist. I just wouldn't. It's uh, I get why people would. I get why you would, but I just I wouldn't completely rule it out. I, they seem to like that other Russian prospect they have. They just mm-hmm. haven't seen him in, the, in North America yet. And with Jari signed to five years, uh, maybe that kind of interferes with Blomquist's trajectory into the NHL. I'm just laying it out there and mm-hmm. leaving it at that. Yeah. I wouldn't give up on Blomqvist just yet because banking on one prospect out of Russia to be, I mean, and already on a team that has very little by way of prospect Mm -hmm. depth to kind of hamstring your best position in the prospect rankings, which is goaltender with both Blomqvist and Mershev, especially right after they traded Cal Klang two years ago at the deadline for Ricard Raquel, which right now is not working out. I think that would be a gross misstep in my opinion. So I think that yes, you know, obviously Friedman mentioned that, yeah, they're going to take calls on Joel Blomqvist. But when you talk about getting younger, that's the quickest way to get younger, the goaltending position. By the end of next year, like next year could be the time we see Blomqvist actually start to get a couple of opportunities at the NHL level. Right. And if he is good enough, then maybe you have an easier discussion when it comes to, hey, if Tristan Jari is still performing well, do you trade him? And if not, that contract becomes easier and easier to move as time goes on because there's less time and less money that other teams have to grab onto and hold on to. So I think that it's lining up actually fairly decently by the fact that by the time that Joel Blomqvist is going to be an everyday NHL or whether that be a one B, whether that be a backup, whether that be at a starting capable level, there's only going to be maybe at most two years remaining on Tristan Jari's contract, which makes it much more easier, much easier to move than it is right now with four years left, even if he's playing at the highest level that he's played at his entire career. So I would say that I would have Blomqvist off the table. And I understand that Dubas is fielding calls on everybody, but it's all about research at that point. It's, Hey, what is the market for this player? Because that also tells him the value that these players have moving forward into the off season, into next season, which is something that every general manager does basically on a day-to-day basis. But that's going to do it for this episode. But we're running almost close to an hour. Um, we didn't get to everybody's questions. We tried to get to as many as possible. We'll maybe dip back into the mail back later this week, but it's going to be an interesting trip here for the Penguins. They go to Western Canada and then also take on the Seattle Kraken, but that's it for this episode of the tip of the iceberg. We're back new episodes, almost every single day, game recaps, almost every single day. Well, now that it's March, almost every single day, but we will be back next time. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Peace. 